So this is, just, this is the study that shows that your response to triptans is better if you take the higher dose. The higher the dose, the, the less, more likely you're going to be pain free. And this is one that shows that the higher the dose, the more likely your headache's gonna come back. So that sounds like a prescription for a medication overuse headache if I've ever heard one. Basically, you know, you take as much as you possibly can, it's gonna leave you pain free as much as possible, but it's more likely your headaches are gonna come back. So, you know, and that's what these patients are sort of going through and, and, it, and it sort of fosters this, this, um, this addiction to, uh, to, to medication taking, particularly in those when it's with the chronic sufferers for whom it's not really working. Medication overuse headache uh, is a huge bane of, uh, I think, our existence. I mean, it's really hard uh, because these patients are addicted to these medications, and they're not d addicted in such a way that, that they, uh, you know, they're getting, getting secondary gain by taking them. It's not euphoria or anything else, but it's like, by God, I've got a headache. I have no hope right this second. If I take this pill, even if it's not going to work, I have maybe some hope that maybe sometimes it'll work. So you get into this habit, and so if there's ever a headache, you know, that comes on, you you, you feel like you, there's, if you don't take something, then then it's like shooting yourself in the foot. So these medications, I mean, I have a, uh, I've had a patient recently that came in that took anison. She took 12 anison every day, you know, and. I don't know whether it's her migraine pain or her anison, and so I try to get her off the, the, those medication, that medication by giving her, you know, a brief stint of narcotic plus the Botox and a talking, you know, and we say, we're not saying that you're an addict, you're just addicted to, the, to wanting to be pain-free, you know, and who wouldn't be? So um, it's interesting, Debbie, you said that you, got, you guys have gone to going to the, the surgery with plans for the weaning afterwards. That's really interesting because I because prior to that every time we've because we've had two surgical symposium uh, in Cleveland over the past two years that Dr. Guyron and Dr. Reed have put on um, along with, do with Dr. Kriegler and now an ENT surgeon that works there at the Ho at University Hospital, but uh, and we've trained uh, 50 new surgeons each of the last two years and there's another one this year. But uh, each time I've gone, we've talked about the fact that medication overuse headache, don't forget about it because it's not going to work if you, know, if you do the surgery. Because there's some sort of exciting or leaky membrane or some problem that those medications cause and they, and they will cause your migraine threshold to be low no matter what these triggers are doing. So Botox and migraines has been used for years uh, for cosmetics. Since the mid '80s, Dr. Garron has been using it uh, because they were using it in children for blepar spasm, you know, for, and also for muscle spasticity in the limbs. And now it's it's uh, FDA approved for uh, cosmetic use. Um, it is injected uh, more than any other medication I think in the country. I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, certainly, as far as cosmetic procedures, it's the number one procedure. And to date, there's still been no. Uh, no uh, systemic ill effects from cosmetic Botox. You've heard a few about a few deaths lately that they've got out in the literature, and I think it's the the wrinkle filler lobby that's getting that in the literature because actually because those compete. Uh, but the uh, the Botox uh, deaths that they've had have been in kids that have gotten like 600 units, and I've never injected more than 100 units, and that's only been in a, mig a significant migraine patient, and I don't inject that much anymore. I only inject generally more than 80. So, uh, and that's what a lot of cosmetic patients are getting 60 and 80 units of Botox all the time, you know, without any, to, you know, any reported uh, uh, systemic uh, ill effects of that. So I think Botox is a very safe medication. I think it's, it is a toxin, um, but, you know, and you can spin that however you want. There have been reports of, of, of Botox working in the literature for years, little snippets here and there in different uh, types of literature. They did do a study looking at Botox and comparing it to placebos, and it was, it was no offense, but it was put on by neurologists. <laughs> and when they injected the Botox, they injected the Botox as a bandana all the way around the head. Uh, or what was your other way? The, the follow the pain. Oh, it hurts here? Okay, I'll inject there. Absolutely no regard to the underlying uh, anatomy, to where the nerves were, to where the muscles are and where the nerves are exiting through those muscles. I presume the theory was is that if you injected it under the scalp that it somehow leaked into the brain, right? I mean, isn't that what they're thinking? We've sort of already talked about some of this. Uh, um, 
basically it all began with, 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 with cosmetic Botox and, and people getting relief with their headaches and then also the surgical version of, of brow Botox is a brow lift and those patients were also coming back saying I haven't had a headache in two years and I like my brow. And that he, Dr. Guyron heard that enough to where he finally did a retrospective study, small retrospective study, 31 patients, and they were all IHS, uh, uh, met IHS criteria for, criteria for migraine headaches. And they had a significant improvement after their brow lift, but this is all retrospective. Subsequent to that, they looked at Botox, and people that responded to Botox did far better than, uh, surgically than those that didn't respond to, the, to Botox. It which, which sort of established Botox as a, prog as a predictor or prognosticator of surgical success. Um, and primarily because Botox lasts about three months. It, it, you know, it interrupts that, the, the communication between the nerve and the muscle, so the, the muscle gets kind of weak. And that, that Botox falls off after about three months' time, and they were curiously finding that people's headaches would get better for, for six to 12 weeks after a Botox injection. Um, which is exactly the period of time that Botox works on muscle. So naturally we think that the Botox is having its effect on the muscle. Uh, there may be some effects in the nerve that have shown that it does go down the axon, I believe, but in terms of what it does, no one really knows it, or if it does anything uh, uh, inside the, the brain. Finally, uh, the prospective randomized trial comparing four zones of surgical treatment is a paper I'll get to called Comprehensive Treatment of Migraine Headaches. And it was quite a, uh, a, an impressive study. And then this last one here is the uh, uh, placebo sham surgery, which is now finished and up for publication. It's been presented to JAMA, and they turned it down. It's been presented to, it's now being presented to Headache. Um, and uh, it's remarkable data. We've talked about this. The, the temporalis impinging on the zygomatic or temporal branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is a tiny little nerve right here, it's a nerve that when, pe when cosmetic surgeons do brow lifts, they cut it all the time. I mean, it's like the size of a hair and it's the sensory distribution you can't even really find. But in migraine patients, it's quite an important nerve and, and that's the only nerve that we remove. People think, oh gosh, you remove these nerves. But these, this, this particular nerve, that is done, um, but it's something that is, uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of cosmetic surgeons don't even know its name. Or they're not even sure it's a nerve, really, when they go by it. The occipital semispinalis capitis uh, um, impinging on the greater occipital nerve, that's a pretty big nerve back there. It does a lot of sensation at the back of the scalp. And, and, and that nerve is preserved, and I haven't had a single person come back and say they have permanent numbness in the back of their head. Um, the nasal septum and turbinate complex, it's generally people have airway breathing problems. It's a common operation for, for deviated septum and, and, and for sinusitis. Um, and uh, that's the uh, fourth site. The first, which is not up there, is the supraorbital supratrochlear nerves, which are coming through right through the frowning muscle, which is where the whole brow lift thing comes in. This is a comprehensive uh, surgical treatment of migraine headaches. came out in January of 2005, plastic reconstructive surgery, and basically showed uh, uh, 82 out of 89 patients had at least 50% reduction in severity, duration, or frequency. Um, 31 out of the 82 patients had complete elimination of headaches with a follow-up of, of just over a year. And now you have what? Don't you have four-year data on this, on these people? Five-year data. And what kind of recurrence rates do you have? Because I didn't have that. Really no recurrence rates. So it seems to be working pretty permanently as long as you, you know, if you think five years is permanent, which I do. Um, so we look at, uh, it, it, and it showed, and these are some important things. Average days lost from work per month went from 44.4 to 1.2, and the controls went from 6.2 to 4.4, to and then the annualized cost of treatment went from 7,600 pre-treatment dropped to $925 a the year uh, following treatment. And why Anthem of Maine doesn't jump right on that, I don't know, because they certainly have in Ohio and they have in Kansas as well. 